Well, good evening and welcome to 412 Church. We're glad you joined us this evening. I'm Pastor Roy. This is the Wednesday night Bible study. We have fun, then we get serious. So now it's for the serious time. So to begin that, let's go ahead and pray and we'll get into this. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to come together, Lord. Uh, truly, uh, we're grateful that we can come together, that we can dig into your word, we can learn and see the things that you have for us, Lord. And truly, as we learn, that we would be more mindful of looking for you all around us, Lord. As we're going through the Psalms, we're just being able to see Jesus in the Psalms, Lord. We pray that in our life, the things that we go through, even the not-so-fun things, that we would be able to see you in those moments, Lord. So we thank you for these opportunities. We thank you for the, um, the fact that we can come together, that we can grow and we can learn and just the work that you're doing in each and every one of us, Lord. Pray for your, the word and the message tonight. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So we're in a series called Seeing Jesus in the Psalms. Uh, it's one of taking a different viewpoint of things, which is good because sometimes we have to change our viewpoint. Now, I don't know about you, but has anyone had specialized training? None of you? Really? In anything, specialized training in anything. Okay, somebody raised their hand. All right. There's some of you guys that have had specialized training. I know it. You're just not answering the question. But in that regards, uh, sometimes we can get training. We can be trained. We can also be conditioned to look at things a certain way. Can we not? Um, safety aspects of things, we could always be looking for the ways that things could go wrong problems that can occur. I've had training in law enforcement training and some other things, so I, I learned to assess situations. I'm also a very observant person, so I'm always watching what's going on. Um, and in doing so, the training, you go through scenarios and real life training, so that way you can read situations that happen. In that same regards, I've been through college and I got a degree in psychology, so I get to psychoanalyze everybody, right? Which is great when everyone finds that out because they don't want to talk to me anymore. <laughs> And then I tell my pastor, and I go, oh, now I really don't want to talk to you. Um, but in that training, it's helped me to like watch situations. The problem is, though I can have the training, though I can go through certain things and I can watch situations play out, does that always mean the worst case is going to happen? No. But at the same point in time, could that mean I can miss some of the things that go on in life? Very much. And what we're going to be looking at in the Psalms, it's easy to read the Psalms and to see things a certain way. And we're going to be looking, and our viewpoint's going to change, because we're looking at seeing Jesus in the Psalms. So I want to help you guys in developing that. Are you guys ready with that? So I want to show you some pictures, and in these pictures is going to either be an animal or an insect or something. I want to see if you guys can see these things. Ready? We'll go with the first one here. You guys all see the owl? That's right there. Right there. There's the owl. All right, fine. That was an easy one. All right, we'll try this one. All right, so can you see the leopard? All you see is trees. All, you see is trees. <laughs> all right, the leopard's actually sitting right there. Oh, so all you that said yes, were you right? All right, all right. Okay, we'll go with this one. What do you see? Who sees a turtle? Who sees a rock? There's a bird right there. Oh. All right. How about this one? You see the sloth? What sloth is going to climb a hill? What if I told you there was three owls in that picture? Do you see them? There's one right there. Two, three. Okay. I got a difficult one coming up. So, uh, yes, they're real photos. I mean, I'll Photoshop stuff, but this is real. All right. You guys looking? You... Giraffe right there, right? All right, we're doing good. All right, here's this next one. Alligator? You think it's an alligator? All I'm going to tell you is when I tell you on this one, I don't want to find this thing. It's right here. It's a spider. And I do not want to find that spider anywhere in my house car or anything it's this so the spider's got his legs going right through there and the back legs going up and the body of it right in there it's one fuzzy looking uh-uh no all right this one's fun hopefully you guys will get this one pretty fast squirrel all right all right 
This is another difficult one. There's a spider again right there. All right. Here's another one for you. Stink bug? Stick bug? <laughs> Come on, the stick is not going to be the obvious thing. There is. There is a frog right here. You can see the leg sitting on the back of the stick right there, and it goes up. There's a frog. All right, so you guys have all been doing good, right? You guys have been trained in this. You can spot the animal or the insect, right? The last one's the toughest. You ready for it? Let's go for it. You guys see it? Did you guys find it? Are you ready for it? There's absolutely nothing there. <laughs> but because of the conditioning coming before that, what were you all looking for? Something, right? But the problem was there was nothing there. As we go into Psalms chapter 1, the most common view of Psalms chapter 1 is looking at two descriptions, one of a righteous man and one of a wicked man. And this could be the standard way to look at Psalms chapter 1, but what if I told you there was another way to look at Psalms chapter 1? And it comes with the translation of the first verse, and the first verse opens, it says, blessed is the man. But a better translation would be, blessed is the one, which may be a stronger translation, but this also makes this psalm not about humanity in general, but about a particular person, one particular person, a righteous man who was called blessed, referencing the redemptive presence of God. And in turn, Psalms 1 can actually be foreshadowing to the perfectly blessed man, Jesus. Jesus is pictured as the blessed man in Psalms chapter 1, making this truly not just only about Jesus, but about mankind and about the son of man. Psalms 1 can be seen as the ultimate psalms about Jesus. It perfectly describes who he is. He's the ultimate blessed man because he is blessed. He lived among the wicked, yet he did not follow their ways. He delighted in God's word and he meditated upon it. And in it, we can see the picture of Jesus. When we recognize the importance of Jesus in this passage, it then shows us where humanity falls into as far as our role and where we could be found. One theologian put it this way, the meaning and fulfillment, fulfillment of the human person is bound up with the meaning and person of the son of man who came to abolish, not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So in this, in this psalm, we could not reach righteousness if Christ had not first been a righteous man. We cannot be delighted in the word if Christ himself was not delighted in the word of God. Our habits, our actions as Christ's followers should follow the example of Jesus, all of which can be seen in Psalms chapter, or Psalms 1. So we're going to look at Psalms 1 tonight. The title of the message is The Righteous One, Jesus. If you made your way there, yay. Let's pick up. We're going to read the entire chapter. It's a long one. It's six verses. It's going to take us a while tonight. We're going to read it in its fullness, then we're going to go back and we're going to look at it, all right? So picking up in Psalms chapter 1, verse 1, says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season whose leaves also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Verse 4 says, The ungodly are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. He includes in verse 6 and says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So the first thing that we're going to see as we dive into Psalms and look at this, we're going to break it down into a couple parts. The first part that we see is the blessings of the righteous in verses 1 through 3. 
Verse one begins by explaining the blessings that we can see, but it's kind of interesting. You know how like people like to put a play on things? If you look at it, it's kind of got a negative take, right? A negative view of how it looks at. I don't see it so much as a negative view, but a very obvious view. And sometimes when things are obvious, what do they sound? Negative. But there's some truth in it. Listen to verse one again. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. I'm going to read it to you from the CSB version, and it says it this way. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, or stand in the pathway with sinners, or sits in the company of mockers. The very verse starts off with one word, blessed. Blessed can be simply translated to mean happy on the very simple side of things, right? But we have to be careful with looking at things as simply as they are. And this goes not only for this verse, but also when we read the Beatitudes, it talks about the blessed, right? But if we read them simply as what it is, we have to be careful because of what the word does. Happy is a subjective word that truly is a state, a feeling. And Jesus wouldn't be declaring to us as his followers that we need to be in a certain state or feeling, would he? He'd want something more direct for us, something more full. So he's making an objective statement here in the opening about his people. So we're not going to look at blessed simply as happy. We're going to look at blessed this way. Blessed is a positive judgment by God on the individual that means to be approved. All right? So when looking at it this way, so when God is blessed and he blesses us, we are approved by him. All right? So if we look at the first verse again and we read it, And the opening statement would mean to be approved is the one who does not do these things. Then it doesn't quite have that negative sting to it, does it anymore? Now it's stating some obvious facts that we're not to do. And what are we not to do? We're not to walk, nor stand, nor sit in three specific areas of our life. And what we're being told here is to watch the progress of our thinking, our behavior, and our belonging to And the author explains that there's a downward progress that takes place here if we do these things wrong. So starting with the first one, walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. With regards to our thinking as blessed or approved ones, means we need to have some what in our life? Discernment. We need to be able to understand what is good and what is bad. What should we take in? What should we not take in? And unfortunately, advice comes at us all the time, right? And sometimes we even seek advice. And sometimes we seek advice from not the greatest people, because why? We're walking around. And if we walk around, we're kind of moving, and we're kind of listening, and we throw things out there, and we have to hear what people say, and we kind of keep going, right? But as we walk, we listen to the advice. The thing that we have to be careful of is where that advice is coming from. Is it coming from the Word of God? Is it sitting there and uh, reaching our desires of our flesh, or is it the desires of God, as it says in 1 John chapter 2? Is the counsel godly counsel? Is it words from him, as the psalmist would say in Psalms 119.24, stating about God's word, is your testimonies are my delight, they are my counselors? Are we looking at this and saying, hey, I can learn from this, I can grow from it? Do we filter the things through it, or do we just simply take it as face value because someone told us? Any good advice, any solid advice will always come back to the Word of God and will point us in a direction to glorify Him, not to feed our sinful, fleshly desires. But of course, as we walk, we're not closely associated to things, right? But what's the next thing that it points out there? Nor stand in the path of sinners. So now we're no longer moving, we have come to a stop. We're now standing with. So now it's more of an association, in the way of. Because in the path of the sinners, we know it to be what? The wide path. The broad path. And if we're not walking now, we're stopping, what are we in the way of? Everything going on. But we're also lending more of an ear to what's being said to us. And we're being drawn in because we're no longer able to freely go with it. We're now, because said, we can be seen as being associated with a group. The behavior of the blessed or the approved person knows the path ahead of them. When they see the wide path, they're going to tend to lean away from the wide path. 
They're going to go down the path less traveled because they know that that is the way that God would have them to go. They wouldn't stop in the middle of the wide road, the comfortable space, because that's not where they need to be. Jesus tells us this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 about this. He goes, enter by the way of the narrow gate. For the gate that is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. If we're coming up on a group and it's standing in the way of our path and we're kind of leaning in what to say and they're taking up a big chunk of the road, that's not a group that we want to stand by. That's not a group that we want to be associated with. As blessed, we understand, hey, that's a group that's going to get me distracted. That's a group that's going to take me away from where I'm going, the path that I'm leading on. The blessed or approved person knows the direction that they are going. They understand that God's going to lead them by the way that he would have them to go. As he says in Psalms chapter 16, he says, I will show you the path of life. Your presence is fullness of joy. Those are the ways that we go. Those are what we learn into. So we see that we don't want to walk with, we don't want to stand, as our behavior and stuff goes. The last one that he gives us here is, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. So the progression goes from thinking, to behaving, to belonging to. Because what happens when you take a seat with someone? Now you're not going to be getting up really easy. You're not going to be walking away very simply. But also, that also means you might be drawn more into the conversation. Heck, you might even be leading the conversation. You might be the one offering the criticism. The progression goes down. But the blessed knows where to sit. The blessed knows who to be in group with and who not to be in group with. The blessed or approved person knows that they want to sit not in the destructive group, but they want to camp in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. With this, the blessed or approved see the process of thinking. Behaving and belonging to is obvious and clear. Yes, it can be tricky at times because there's those people that we lean in that we see for truth, that we get the advice from, that we want to listen to, that we want to stand by, that we want to be associated with, but the problem is they're not always going to lead us down the path we want to go. They're not always going to be there to help us and to encourage us. But the joy is when we're blessed, we understand who we want to walk with, who we want to stand next to, and who we want to be seated at. And that is a blessing that we can have because of the one that we are connected to in Jesus Christ and the example that he gives us. Verse 2 carries on that the blesser approved does what? It says there in verse 2, delights in the law of the Lord and his laws he meditates day and night. Real quick to understand this, he's not talking about when he says in the law of the Lord, the first five books of the Old Testament, okay? Those are the laws. When he's talking about the law of the Lord, he's talking about the entire book, entire book right here. All right? So it doesn't mean you can pick and choose the parts you want to. It doesn't mean that you cannot go to certain sections because you don't want to. It doesn't mean anything that rubs you the wrong way, you ignore. You look at the whole entirety word of God. The righteous man is delighted in the whole word of God. He finds truth in it. He finds joy in it. Yes, he might find correction in it, but for his veterans. And in doing so, he's excited. Question, what excites you? Does anything excite you? We should all have joy. I have a friend that always asks me every time I talk to him, the first question out of his mouth is, where's your joy at, Roy? And I'm like, it's about here. <laughs> but we have to have joy. The things we're excited about are things that we talk about. Where we have joy are the areas that we share. And if we're in God's word, that should excite us. That should joy us. When we come to someone and they're like, hey, what have you been learning? And go, actually, you know what? I've been reading in the Psalms lately. You know what I've been looking at? I've been seeing this. You're going to be sharing, right? And of course, the fun one's like, so what have you been learning lately? A lot of names. Why is that? I'm in numbers. <sighs> Man, how do you get through that? I don't. I push. But we should be excited, right? We should be joyful. We should be in God's word. And we should be sharing about that. So we're being filled with something that is good, that is great for us, something that we could be lifting up others and we can be showing them. And people in us should be looking like, what's up with him? What's up with her? Why are they so joyful? You're like, because you should see what I read today. You should see what I learned about, what God showed me. And we should be sharing those things to those around us. And we should be seeking 
to be able to be an influence to those people that come with us. And since we're filled with this awesome information, we need to process it, right? The scripture tells us what? That we should meditate on it. Now to clarify real quick on meditation, Eastern meditation tells you that you what? Empty yourself. I don't know about you, but if I empty myself, that creates a vacuum and something bad's coming in. We don't want to empty ourselves. As far as Christian meditation, it means fill yourself. What's the best thing that we can fill ourselves with? God's word, God's law, God's truth. We put that stuff into us and guess what? It starts to change us. We start to appear differently. We're not always grumpy anymore, right? We're a little bit happy sometimes. You, small smiles, right? You start going in the right direction. The righteous person ponders on God's word. They don't simply just hear it and forget it and move on, but they chew on it. They learn from it. They get to know it and to understand it. So that way they can what? Live it out in their lives. The psalmist said it best in Psalms 119, verses 98 through 99. I'm going to read it from the NLT version. It says, Oh, how I love your instructions. I think about them all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are my constant guide. Or, for the, his words are a constant guide. Yes, I have more insight than my teachers, for I am always thinking of your laws. That's how we should view God's word in our life. The blessed view God's word as an, a joy to see it. They're delighted in it, and they grow from it. So here we see the blessings of the righteous one. And in the third verse, it goes on to tell us even more blessings that the righteous have. It says in verse 3, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, and bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaves also shall not wither, and wherever he does, he shall prosper. This picture here of the blessings of the righteous one is a tree. And not just a weak little sapling tree, but a large tree that's plugged into a life source, a river of water that it's pouring into. And in doing so, that tree is being filled up with life, and then it is producing fruit. It doesn't have any dead leaves on it. It's not withering away, but it's being a blessing to those that, it comes in, that come in contact with it. And in that idea that it's giving there, it means that the righteous one is, as, um, as long as we are grounded in the truth, the living water, right? And the living water is who? Jesus Christ, right? John tells us about that as the story whenever Jesus comes to the well with the woman, right? And he's sitting there and he asks for a drink of water and she's a little shocked, like, why are you asking me for a drink of water? And he's like, because I don't got a bucket, duh. You got one. She gives him a drink of water and she's talking with him and then she comes, he comes to the point and goes, if you knew who I was and what I had to offer, the living water, you'd be asking me for a drink. He is our living water. He is the one that truly can give us life. And as he gives us life and we come to him, changes start to take place in our life, right? The Holy Spirit begins to work. We begin to become nice people. Not really nice people, right? What happens? We start to bear fruit, right? And what is the fruit? Well, Paul tells us the fruit isn't, is this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is our fruit, that is what is coming out of us because of the living water that we have. And also know this, as unfortunately, none of these fruits come on instantly. We got to wait for our seasons, okay? So we got to wait for time. We got to be into that water. We got to be growing. The Holy Spirit's doing a work in us, right? And as it comes around, what? These things start to come out. And as these things come out, we start to bear fruit. People come around us. They're blessed by us because why? We're tied into what God would have for us. And the other thing that we get is we get life, and life eternally, life with him. There is no greater thing that we can have than to have life with him. And then we mature, we grow, we're a blessing to those around us, and truly we get to see God at work, not only in our lives, but those that we come in contact with. So we see here the first half. We see the blessings of the righteousness. Now we're going to transition to the second half of the psalm, and we're going to see the curse of the unrighteous. Let's read verses 4 through 5 again. Verse 4 says, The ungodly are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. This half's way more direct, if you want to meet, ask me, than the first half. The first half was like pretty straightforward. This is way more direct. The curse of the unrighteous. Everything that we just read about the blessings do not stand for the unrighteous. They have no life source. They have no 
fruit. If anything, they have ill fruit. They have no blessings. They have no life. They have nothing. And it says it pretty matter of fact there that their curse is straight up nothing. No good. None so ever. And then it gives the picture not of a great furious tree, but of what? Chaff. And just so you know, chaff is the little stuff that's around the kernel of a um, wheat grain. And the best part about it is he says there that it's driven away by the wind. To separate the chaff from the wheat, you know all you have to do is toss it up in the air. The wheat falls and the chaff kind of floats off, which means it's lightless. It's got no weight to it. It has nothing. It could be tossed by the wind very simply. And it's seen here that it says that therefore the ungodly should now stand in judgment. You know why they can't stand in judgment when it comes time to weigh in? They have no weight because they have no life. They have nothing to hold them, nothing to show for the things that they do. And as a result, they fall to the side. And continuing there, it says, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous crazy thing is, the sinners sometimes think they're pretty special sometimes, right? They think they're getting blessings from God because life's going good for them and everything is great. But the reality of the fact is, is when they get around Christians or Christ followers, their life doesn't measure up the same way, right? And then as much as they think that they can act and they can do the things they've always done, in light of that audience, guess what? They're not welcome. And they're not welcome not because of the Christ followers, it's because of them. They feel uncomfortable. They feel out of place and they remove themselves from the situation because they realize they, have, they actually don't have what they think they have. And truly their path, their judgment will become a day of separation, a day where they will be cast away from their creator and sent to hell. The curse of the unrighteous is not one to be taken lightly. It is truly one of separation and vain rewards. And while it may seem to have some fruit truly it has nothing. It's deception and destruction. The psalmist goes on to conclude with a simple yet powerful statement in verse 6 as he ends it out saying, The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The righteous can have peace because they have placed their righteousness in Christ Jesus, the source of righteousness. And as a result, the God of heaven is watching over us protecting and preserving us till the day that he chooses to take us home and hopefully soon for some of us right Amen. on the other hand the curse of the unrighteous is destruction as they are on the wide path the comfortable path loaded with friends but truly on a path that they will perish the psalm ends here like anything as we look at it we have to understand so what the question that uh, I looked through and I struggled with, and this one as far as the so what is, is Jesus the main influence in your life? Unfortunately, as human beings, we allow culture to shape the way that we work, the way that we play, the way that we make a difference, the things that we do, how we view ourselves and others. Culture affects our values, what we consider to be right and to be wrong, the information that we take in and who we listen to and who we trust. The question is, who's influencing you? Who's influencing me? Our life, our decisions, our dreams, our values, how we determine what is right and what is wrong, where does that come from? Who does that come from? Does it come from the world that would tell you that wrong is right and right is wrong? To only look out for yourself? Or are you looking to Jesus who would tell you what is correct, how to stand, and give you the strength to stand? Hopefully the world is not leading you astray with the false hopes and the false promises as it can often do. Hopefully you're allowing Jesus to be the influence of your life. But how do we know if we're leaning the right way or the wrong way? I got four things that we can look at, four ways that Jesus influences our life. And if you see these influences in your life, it's going to let you know that truly you're walking the righteous path. So the first way that Jesus influences our life is Jesus transforms our minds. Romans says it this way in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. 
Though this world will try to influence us and try to sway us, as a Christ follower, we're not to be conformed to the world, to the culture. We're to be conformed to what God would have us to be. And as Christ followers, that means that we have to be working on what? Our minds. Because we come to Christ, we have a bad way of thinking at first, right? Because we have the world way. A stinking thinking, I think, is the way they say it. We have to change that thinking, right? And when we come to Christ, he starts to work on us. He starts to help us to realize the truths that we need to stand, the wisdom that we need to take, and how our mind is transformed so that we do what? We can understand what God's will is, his perfect will, his acceptable will, and his good will. And then we're able to explain that to people. And we're able to shed light into situations. We're able to say what is right is right over what is right is wrong. And we can influence our world. If Jesus is influencing our lives, truly he is transforming our mind. Not only does he transform our mind, Jesus transforms our desires. Jesus told his disciples this in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your own soul? Often our desires are to chase our dreams, to chase our fantasies, to chase everything that is the world would have to say. But not so with God. And when Jesus comes into our lives and he's influencing our lives, he's shifting our thoughts not just about what the world would have, but about what we can do for him. The desires to serve him, to be with him, and truly in that place, our soul is in a better place. Jesus transforms our worldly desires into the desires for him and his kingdom. So we see so far that Jesus influences our lives through transforming our mind, transforming our desires, and transforming our relationships. Have you ever noticed without Jesus, all your friendships and relationships are drama? Okay, it's just me. Cool. <laughs> drama, right? And why is that? Because everyone's out for who? Themselves. So how do you have friends if you're selfish? I still don't know the answer to that question. If Jesus is involved in our lives, he's transforming our relationships and the way that we interact with others, our families, and even total strangers. And this comes down to a simple thing that's in our lives that's not there before. It's the love for others. The, uh, a religious leader came to Jesus and asked him what the greatest commandment was, right? And Jesus told him that if you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and all your strength, right? But then what does he go on to tell him in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 12, verse 31? The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. If Jesus has influenced us, there's something that we have that the world does not offer in any way, shape, or form, and that is to love others. Even the ones we can't put up with, the ones that we think that are just, oh, we love them. Our relationships change. We're no longer looking out for what? Selfish us. But we're looking out for others. We're caring for others. And he is doing a work. And guess what? There's a lot less drama. You notice I said a lot less drama. There's still drama. But in it, as we love, we forgive, and the relationships are way smoother. So, so far we've seen that Jesus, if Jesus influences our lives, Jesus transforms our mind, transforms our desires, transforms our relationships, and transforms, lastly, our purpose. One of the amazing things about being a Christ follower is that our purpose for living is transformed into something that is fulfilling. No longer ill or fruitless, but fulfilling. We're no longer working to make ends meet. We're no longer climbing the social ladder to be on top. We are now working for a greater purpose, for what God would have for us this way. And it says this, John Jesus told us this in John chapter 15, verse 5. He says, Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. He goes on to say in verses 7 and 8, But if you remain in me and my word remains in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you have produced much fruit, you are my true disciple. This brings great joy to my Father. And as we do this, our purpose changes. We're now working for his kingdom. We're living in a way to bring glory to God. We're serving others. And truly, we are making disciples for him. Our purpose is now God's 
purpose in our lives. And this is because we have allowed Jesus to influence us in all that we do. And if we look at all these things that Jesus does for us, we see that when he is influencing our lives, it's not about us anymore, but it's about giving glory to him, to living a life for him, loving others, and truly being a child of God. And as we've seen here in the Psalms, the o- Psalm 1, the only way that we can do these things is because Jesus has done them first. He has been our example, and he has shown us the blessings that we can have by being a righteous one. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, truly we are thankful for your son that you sent for us. We're thankful for the example that he sets for us as we sh- live our life to imitate him, Lord. I pray for each of my brothers and sisters as they go about their week and they go through their different things that truly they would remember to look to you and to what you would have for each and every one of them as they look for the influences, not of this world, but the influence of your son in their life. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.